Hi, can everybody hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Lockman. Uh, I'm with Google. Uh, I'm very happy to have you all here today uh, on this panel on transparency reports. I'll keep it short, uh, but I want to introduce you to uh, our first speaker uh, today. He will give you an introduction and a rundown on the Hong Kong Transparency Report. His name is Darcy Christ. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> so, um, I'm Darcy Chris. I work at the Journalism and Media Studies Center at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and we were involved in producing the Hong Kong Transparency Report. So to give you a little background of what it is, we've been working on open government issues in Hong Kong for quite some time. Uh, we have a project called OpenGov, where we've explored several issues related to this, access information, open data, transparency, and archive issues. And we were approached by Google to develop an independent report on Hong Kong internet transparency. This all came about because uh, Charles Mock, legislative counselor for information technology, asked the Hong Kong government on the 6th of February for a full disclosure of requests to inter internet organizations. Um, on that day, Gregory So, Secretary of Commerce and Economic Development, responded with the first government disclosure of inter internet requests in Asia. Ten departments made requests, five for user data and eight for content removal. And these were the numbers we received. There were 21,456 requests, and they were broken down subsequently as 14,453 and 7,003 content removal requests. The data that we received initially was incomplete. Uh, we lacked exact dates. We lacked, in most cases, the uh, name of the organizations contacted. And in a few instances, they didn't even tell us whether the requests were fulfilled, whether they were refused or acceded to. Uh, we went to set about, uh, through access to information requests, um, trying to find the missing data. Four departments provided the exact dates and the company names. Two departments just provided dates, but refused, continued to refuse to give us the uh, company names. And three departments have yet to respond. So, a couple notes come out from both the initial release of data and what we got was, all of these requests, none of them were done with a court order. Um, with a few, uh, with an exception, most of them only came with cursory comments about why the requests are done. There is no procedure for releasing these, uh, this data in the future or any kind of systematic uh, procedure to get it um, ongoing um, from the departments. And as I said, the names of the internet organizations were not released. Hong Kong government said that they did not have permission to give these names. <clears throat> So we've taken this data and we've built a website, which is a living report, and I'll show it to you in a second. And we've tried to pull out a few visuals just to help you understand what we've seen. Um, the, acts, the requests that were acceded to was quite a, hard, a large number, uh, 82%, and those refused was 17. The other uh, refers to the Inland Revenue Department, where they actually did not tell us whether their 13 requests were acceded to or not. This breaks down, you can see here, the rejected versus acceded. This graph is a little skewed, but if you look at the numbers, um, oh, sorry, this, this is a little off here in the formatting, I'm sorry. Um, so 3,000, um, almost 4,000 user data requests were refused, but over 10,000 were uh, acceded to. Two content removal requests were refused, the rest were all acceded to. Here's a, a graph showing the breakdown of the departments. Obviously, in content removal, the Department of Health outnumbered uh, considerably all the other ones. In the case of user data requests, the police force um, significantly eclipsed all the other departments. A few things we pulled out. Inland Revenue Department refused to disclose pretty much any information, citing secrecy provisions in, in their ordinances. 
Um, they would not give us any of this data, and when we requested it, they just stated their position, saying that they can't. <coughs> um, the uh, Customs and Excise Department uh, contacted 25 local ISPs, making a total of 16, over 1,600 requests for the name, including Hong Kong identity cards. Uh, they cited crime prevention and detection as reasons for this aggressive policing of the policing of the internet. All of these requests were acceded to. The Lands Department has been <coughs> quite zealous in, in guarding what it terms as government's copyright, specifically around their maps. Um, the department succeeded in three cases in forcing websites to remove these maps. Um, they've been criticized before for charging the public for public information, um, and in contrast, many governments do not charge for this kind of information with maps and things. Um, Legal sale of controlled, non-registered Chinese medicine online was a major concern of the health department, thus the huge number of requests. <clears throat> they uh, contacted six, 16 different platforms for over almost 7,000 links that they wanted removed, and all of those requests were acceded to. Um, but we don't have further details at the moment about this. And they represent 96% of the content removal requests. 86% of the user data requests came from the police department. Um, these were considered a uh, crime. They were involved in uh, investigating criminal activities involving technology or crimes related to the use of the internet. Uh, and you can see that <coughs> they handled a total of 6,800 requests, cases of technology crime, and contacted ISP over 12,000 times. These requests were refused in some cases, um, uh, but a majority of them were acceded to. So, <clears throat> where we stand, we've launched this report now to inform uh, the citizens of Hong Kong um, of the actions of the government. It's up to us, all of us, to continue to monitor and audit, audit it, but we will continue to work on this transparency report. We'd like to see the Hong Kong government voluntarily release, ideally biannually or annually, this data in a more complete form, ideally using something called the Open Net Schema, which we did, which is just a particular organization of the individual requests. It's it's uh, used all over the world, and it's, it's a great way to organize this. Uh, we'd also like to see the data done in an open data format. That means it's accessible online, it's machine readable, and it's, uh, um, and it's freely available. Uh, we'd also like the opportunity to really continue to share this experience with others outside of Hong Kong so that they can learn from what we've done and hopefully do the same in their countries. We've contacted organizations like the Hong Kong I ISP Association and have begun to sp speak to individual ISPs to seek data, um, seek more data from their perspective. Um, we like to, uh, <clears throat> this will allow us to audit the government data to help verify it. And we're seeking statements and policies and transparency reports from these organizations. We're also correlating existing transparency reports, like Google has released theirs, and now Microsoft and Twitter and other organizations are doing that, and we're documenting it. We're continuing to do legal research around the particular reasons the government is making these requests, and we're gonna do outreach to the public, like here, to help understand how everyone can take part in this process. So we can use your help to provide us feedback on the site through several means, social networks, and you can help us look at the data, the data is available, you can download it and start to work with it yourself. And this project was supported in part by Google, we thank them for that. This is our team, and I just want to quickly sort of show you the report, and then we can move on to the panels. <clears throat> so this is the Hong Kong Transparency Report, uh, I actually don't think I included the address, um, but it's transparency.jmsc.hku.hk. But if you search on Hong Kong Transparency Report, you will find it. And uh, we're starting to work on translating this into Chinese. We've done some. So we have um, that available for some of the content. And as we continue to translate the whole site and put up new content, we'll maintain it in two languages so that it's most available for everyone. And as I said, you can get it the CSV format or the Google Sheet, which includes some of the visualizations that we work on. So I encourage you all to. Uh, Check out the report and give us some feedback through the social networks or email or phone. We'd appreciate your help in this.
Thanks, Darcy. That was great. Um, what follows is going to be a quick panel discussion on uh, transparency reports more in general. And we wanted to start off, of course, with uh, why transparency matters for Wikipedia and, and how Wikipedia has, in many ways, been an, uh, a great example for why transparency matters and how it can be done. Uh, and then what follows is, uh, so Andrew is going to start talking about Wikipedia and transparency. Then what follows is uh, me talking about Google and why, why Google uh, cares about transparency. And then uh, what will follow are sort of uh, uh, two comments, uh, thoughts, and reflections from two friends who have been working to get their governments uh, to increase transparency. One is uh, Ot van Dalen, who is Skyping in from Holland. Uh, but thank you for joining us, if you, if you can hear us. And then last but not least, uh, Ying um, will make her comments and reflections on the, on the future of Hong Kong and transparency. Right. I'm sorry? Sure. Can you hear me okay back there? I hope. Great. My name is Andrew Lee. I'm an associate professor of journalism at American University in Washington, D.C. I'm also a longtime Wikipedia editor. I also have a book about Wikipedia called The Wikipedia Revolution. And for a lot of you who are new here, this is the annual conference of Wikipedia editors who tend to be mostly volunteer. We also have staff of the Wikimedia Foundation here as well. But this is the large annual gathering, which has been in a different city every year for the last nine years. And this is the second time it's in Asia. Originally in 2007 it was in Taiwan, and now it's in Hong Kong. And I think it's great timing that we had this, uh, not just because of um, things like Eric Snowden being here for a little while, uh, but you saw that Charles Mock, who was our, one of our keynote speakers this morning, made reference to that. And one of the interesting things is that when Wikipedians, who are all fans of open software, open standards, open processes, and transparency in our own community, heard that we were coming to Hong Kong, most people who've never been to Asia or don't know much about Hong Kong think of this as part of China. And when they think it's part of China, they think about the Great Firewall, internet censorship, surveillance culture. Uh, these types of things got a lot of folks worried. Even with assurances that Hong Kong is indeed its own sovereign territory with a very strong rule of law and that it really is one country, two systems. Uh, you know, folks are cautious and I think that means that we do have very intelligent, skeptical Wikipedia editors uh, who only believe things when they see proof of those things. And what was really interesting about Charles Mock's talk this morning was when they saw Charles Mock get on, this, get on the stage and start talking about how Hong Kong has this type of internet and in China here are the topics you can't talk about and here's the, how the Great Firewall works, and here's what he did as a counselor here in Hong Kong, as a legislator, to demand the release of information from the Hong Kong government. I think I heard an audible gasp from my row in the audience saying, whoa, we weren't expecting this. We were expecting maybe confirmation that, yeah, Hong Kong is a place that has its own rules and can do what it likes um, outside of Beijing, but to actually have a legislator here in Hong Kong be able to demand data that, um, I don't think a legislator in the US would have the power to do is pretty powerful. And I think the audience really responded to that and saw that Hong Kong is a pretty unique place in that regard. So one of the interesting things about things that have happened this year, you all know that Time Magazine chooses a man of the year or a person of the year. If you were to choose a term of the year or an issue of the year, I think transparency would be my quote. Uh, one of the things that U.S. is very much wrestling with right now is with the revelation of NSA surveillance in the U.S. Um, and the inability of certain companies or entities to actually disclose that they even have been requested by the government to do certain things. That is a, a real worry of folks in the United States and I think all over the world since the surveillance of the American agency like the NSA is not just within the U.S. but all over the world. So there have been some interesting headlines. Just this past week, I think just two days ago, LavaBit, which was the email provider for Edward Snowden, shut down, saying that given the types of requests it was presented uh, by the US government, it decided it would rather shut down than to have to put its users at risk. Shortly after that, Silent Circle, which is a very respected uh, security uh, or secure communications provider shut down preemptively. They had not gotten any requests from the US government, but they said, since we cannot assure the 
safety of our customers, we are going to shut down starting today, right now, because we're not sure we can be transparent with you as customers, given the conditions that we have to work under. So that is something that's really serious and really interesting, that um, transparency, which really very few people in the general public talked about a year ago, suddenly becomes front and center here, uh, not just in Hong Kong, but in this month of July, or August and July. Um, so, so a few things I'd like to point out about what makes this Wikipedia and Wikimedia community special. One of the great things is that regardless of what country people come from, their economic uh, status, their age, ethnicity, they all rally around the common Wikipedia ideals that we believe in uh, free culture or a free encyclopedia and free knowledge for everyone. And that means that we assemble that encyclopedia in a way where everyone gets to see everyone else's actions. The default in Wikipedia and the Wikimedia community is to be able to inspect, observe, interact with any and everything that happens within the community. Only in very rare cases do we have to do certain things for either legal reasons or to protect the privacy of certain individuals to hide certain parts of what happens in this community. So we do have requests from the public about Wikipedia that have to be kept in a private email system called OTRS. We might have certain things that run afoul of libel laws that we have to delete from the database in Wikipedia with no one being able to inspect it other than a few people. But those are such a small fraction of what happens in Wikipedia. Everything else is, if you edit Wikipedia today, anyone can see those actions, and hopefully they'll be encouraged by those, build on that, and you can find a community within Wikipedia where people are lifting up each other's work within the community. So I think that's something that is really uh, new and exciting for folks who discover this community, and it's entirely appropriate that we're having this uh, study about transparency here at Wikimania, where you're surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of folks who really believe in this, this principle. Uh, so with that, I will give it over to Lachman, talking about Google and this report. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi, my name is Lachman. Uh, I'm the part of uh, Google's public policy team. Uh, I want to thank all of you to, for coming here. Uh, I'm also, I head uh, the free expression uh, part of Google for Asia and the Pacific. Um, and um, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why Google cares about transparency and um, why it matters. So, um, just a quick confession. I'm actually, I've edited on Wikipedia, and the number of edits is probably so low that's more embarrassing than probably should not reveal, but uh, out of transparency. Um, there you go. Um, the reason why transparency is uh, such a buzzword today, I think, is not so much transparency in itself, as much as if we take a step back and, and, and ask us why do we actually have transparency, it is because we care about an open society, right? And what that means. What does it mean, an open society? It means that people are empowered to do what they want to do. Uh, and in the case of Wikipedia, you can look and see that, how that has an incredibly powerful effect, right? Anyone can edit. You don't have to ask permission for anyone to do so. And that, of course, is radically different from before the internet and after the internet. And it's why Google cares about the open internet. Uh, it wants uh, this society where anybody can be empowered to do what they want to do. And so, recognizing that, um, at the same time, it doesn't mean that, you know, when, 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 we, when, when I stand here and say Google cares about free expression and the open internet, it doesn't mean that anything goes at the same time. Uh, sometimes there are legitimate restrictions, right? Um, and we can uh, debate that, and that's exactly why we should debate it, and that's why we need transparency. Um, when you look at the, the restrictions that we, you know, we, we sometimes get government requests, right, as you probably all know uh, from the media these days. Um, and so when we say that we care about the open internet and we care about our users, uh, user data and, 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 and free expression, then don't take our word for it, right? Uh, look at the data and maybe I can... I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with the Google Transparency Report. If you haven't taken a look at it, uh, I strongly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I 
next to English. So I don't want to go through the whole transparency report here, and I encourage you to go back and, and, and look at it yourself. But quickly, uh, you can see how uh, traffic to our websites uh, are effective or not. So you can actually see if YouTube is being disrupted in a particular country. Uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, we also outlined the removal requests that we got, right? Um, and the user data requests that we got. Um, and something that we added recently new that you might want to take a look at is, is this uh, safe browsing, uh, where we sort of mark when we think websites are unsafe and we take action on behalf of the user. But just to go back, uh, this is recognizing that you know, like if we want the internet to stay open, we need to be very clear and transparent about the kind of requests we get uh, to make sure that our users actually trust the service that we have. Uh, and so that's why you can look at like the you know the number of requests we get from each government, uh, what you know like when that happens, how many uh, requests we actually acceded to, and which ones we we denied and for what reason, right, uh, and all that. Uh, it is so that you don't have to trust our word for it. Uh, you can keep us you know it's your job to keep us accountable, right, in that way. Um, and so, and this is essential for keeping the internet open. Uh, if we don't have this trust, then basically we go back to a closed model. And it's encouraging. We started this about three years ago, uh, and we have been iterating and iterating and improving it, uh, adding more and more data to it and, and more fine grained details. Uh, and it's encouraging to see that other companies have been following our lead. Uh, and it's not just Google now that has a transparency, but many other companies have it now. Um, and I think the Hong Kong Transparency Report actually links to all the transparency reports, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and the natural next step for in this was, of course, to get governments to come out with their own uh, transparency reports. So that's why we have been encouraging the Hong Kong University to work on a transparency report for the Hong Kong government. And that's why we're very pleased uh, to see that this has been coming together. Uh, we also have been uh, working in, in, in several other countries uh, to get this done. And so, for example, Estonia now has a transparency report. Uh, and some other countries, and, and Holland, for example, uh, you know, their efforts to, to improve and increase transparency there as well, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but so, uh, just to sum up, I, if we care about an open society, and we want to empower users, and we want them to trust each other, then we need transparency. Um, with that, I, Bob, are you there? Yes, yeah, sir. Hi, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Bits of Freedom's efforts to, you know, uh, get the Dutch government accountable and, and increase transparency? Yeah. So, uh, so thank you all for, uh, for having me. Uh, apologies for uh, not being on the video. Uh, my internet connection is uh, not worked well. Uh, um, so, Victor uh, Freedom is a rights organization, organization, and we focus on communication, freedom, and privacy on the internet. And um, uh, this obviously ties into a lot of the work um, uh, transparency which is going on around the world. Um, and uh, actually, it's one of the reasons why we started in the first 2001. Um, into the Dutch government was not really uh, wasn't publishing how many wiretaps they were placing on uh, normal telephones, like fixed lines and mobile telephones. Um, we were able uh, to achieve uh, obtain this information through a through a press after this, and it turned out that uh, the Dutch government actually was at the, um, in the world with, with the most wiretaps in the world. They uh, wired uh, more per day. Uh, the uh, U.S. country uh, in, in the United States does per year. Now, of course, it was before the NSA revelations. So, uh, I think 
a statute which actually inhibits this. Um, it turned out in in and uh, when uh, just the uh, Ministry of Justice to uh, publish uh, this information. In the Ministry of Justice said, okay, if we do this, then uh, we will start criminal proceedings against your uh, CEO. And this has such a impact on the industry that, uh, that, that now a lot of uh, the uh, uh, these are very wary of risking this. So we have sent a letter to the Dutch government asking them to confirm that this is not criminal. Hey, can you hear me? Now, first, uh, sorry, yeah. Hey, the connection is uh, dropping in and out. Uh, do you have any problem hearing from our side? Because like you're dropping every five, ten seconds or so. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Can you um, maybe wrap oh, it up? Okay. Can you maybe wrap it up, and then we'll uh, go straight to the uh, meeting and then the discussion. And I hope you can stay online for questions. But uh, given the bad connection, maybe. Uh, can <coughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And then you can follow up. Well, then, uh, and, and we also will push for legislation. That's the, uh, the first one. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Al. Sorry about that. Um, Ying? OK. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you see me, actually? <laughs> uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, maybe just, uh, I want to ask quickly. Uh, members of the media, can you raise your hands? Oh, okay. So we could show the media. It's very impressive. So, um, thank you. And um, I'm, my name is Ying Chen. I teach as journalism at the University of Hong Kong and I'm the director of the Journalism and Media Studies Center and uh, that hosted this uh, work on this project called Hong Kong Transparency Report. And uh, so I'm we're very pleased to have been working with Google. Uh, I want to make, uh, I think, three brief points. Uh, number one, I call it the Snowden effect. Uh, we, Snowden showed up and left. For us in Hong Kong, uh, I think it marked a kind of loss of innocence for us in our use of the internet, uh, doing all these fun things like Facebook, like all these uh, social media stuff. At least for me, I know that there's a great firewall. Uh, Charles Mark talked about it this morning. So when I go to China, I would be careful. I would. Um, take a laptop that's not loaded with uh, maybe not so good stuff, or not so brutally correct stuff. Uh, when I use my cell phone, I would be careful. I mean, not put it in the freezer like Snowden did. Uh, but I was told when, if you want your um, uh, conversation to be more private, not only you have to turn it off, as standard practice, you need to take out the battery. Right. So I, I, I did that sometimes when I, I was in China. But it never occurred to me, and at least I never thought that I need to be also careful, whether it be in Hong Kong or whether it be in the United States or elsewhere, because of this big uh, uh, monitor by the um, NSA in the United States. So I think that for, for Snowden to show up, uh, it does you know, we've been reminded we, we need to be uh, cautious. Now, but what does that mean? Um, the, that takes me my, to my second point. Now, in Hong Kong, in spite of our um, challenges uh, in terms of press freedom, in, in terms of worries, we still enjoy the system called one country, two systems. It's under a lot of stress and stress, but we still uh, have this uh, system. Then what does that mean? It means that um, we, uh, we enjoy press freedom, we enjoy freedom of expression here. Uh, we can publish a book, we can publish a media or a newspaper. We don't have to get a license. In Hong Kong, you, you, you don't need to get a license to be a reporter. 
reporters here um, think don't get shot and killed. Um, and in terms of uh, papers or whatever we write and we, whatever we publish, we don't have censorship. I mean, pre-censorship, like in Myanmar in just a year ago, before you write anything, you have to submit to the center, uh, censor, and the, the copies come back with red lines, and you have to change it. And you don't have censorship like in China, where you get it, um, where editors would get short messages all the time about what to write and what not to write, not to write. So we don't look at those things. Um, but on the other hand, we do um, have been taking our freedom for granted, which means that just look at the, date, the analysis we did with the uh, Hong Kong Transparency Report. The government departments would just go to ISPs, go to internet organizations, and ask for data of the users. The um, government would ask that content should be removed. Almost 100% of the ISPs, of the internet organizations that were asked that got the request, acceded to the request. Almost 100% of the requests were just done administratively without resorting to a court order because we just, very lame, we just accepted it as if that is the right of the government to ask and for, to get those information. And until we look at those data closely, then we find that, well, you know, the government has been having an easy time getting the data, getting uh, information, uh, and asking for certain information to be removed. Um, there's no complaint. There's no complaint. All this done very smooth. That situation has to stop. We need to be more vigilant. We need to defend our, our freedom. We need to defend our right to use the internet um, in privacy. Um, there are legitimate reasons for government to um, do uh, to request for information, but they need to give us reasons. They need to be more transparent. They cannot take us for granted. They need to stop taking us for granted. So. Um, so that takes me to my third point, is that um, in going forward, the, we need to be more vigilant, we need to work together, we need to understand uh, our rights. So it's not just press freedom in general, it's not just the right to say things, to, to, to publish, but the digital age has taken the challenges to a whole new dimension. And Hong Kong has a special role to play because we're here. Um, we're just next door to China. Whatever is done here is being watched very closely by the authorities in China, but also by the public in China, by the people of China. And whatever we do here could serve as a model of transparency, and of uh, accountability on the part of uh, government. So uh, we look forward to continue to develop this transparency project in Hong Kong. Uh, a lot more research needs to be done. What we have done is really scratching the surface. Uh, even with the data that uh, Greg Rousseau has uh, released in February, even within those data, there's a lot more questions that we should be asking. So we'll be working more on those data, and we're going to ask for more information, and we look forward to participation from the media and from the public. Thank you.
take some questions. this, we definitely want to make more people aware and do more outreach in the community. Um, that will provide some feedback and some, I don't think this is working, or is it? Sorry. sorry. Provide some better feedback so so we know, make sure that we're covering all bases and that the information is clear. But alongside of that, we, we, we've seen that uh, scratching the surface of this data, we need to um, continue to pull it out, but also ask the tougher questions to the individual departments through access to information to the about individual requests and why they were <coughs> um, Because the data release was very simple. Some of them didn't say why, but the examples, when they did say, they were very cursory. So we need to have more further discussions along that line. Uh, I think another thing we want to do and we need to do is to work with other stakeholders like ISPs, like the social <coughs> industry groups, um, and um, it would be in the interest to ask government that they can release the information. Now, we ask the, the government departments as a follow-up to the discussion at Lexco in February. We ask um, the departments to say, well, who are these ISPs that you contacted uh, to request for removal of information of, of content? And they said, and the government said, well, we can give it to you because we need to ask these ISPs for permission. So why, how about ISPs go and volunteer and they say, we release you of, uh, of responsibilities. And which is exactly at what the ISPs, right, companies are doing in the US, right? They don't want to be tainted. They want to disclose. Disclosure and transparency is good for business. So we would like to work more with business um, and just to uh, promote the spirit of transparency. Um, I, I got a question to the JMC. Um, did you come across any kind of definition issues? What, are, what constitutes a government request? For example, um, in my country, Germany, the government has somehow slightly outsourced some topics like protection of minors to state-sponsored private entities. They would make the request against Google um, um, removing some topic from the search engine. Would that be a, a government request in your point of view? Is it included in the report? Uh, would you have any kind of access to, um, let's say, state-sponsored requests of pro requests via proxy? Um, not yet. We didn't see that from the data that we have. Right now, the most of the requests by the government is for alleged internet crime, for uh, alleged copyright violations, um, links to force uh, uh, promotion of Chinese medicine. Uh, so, we, but we need to go to government more and we want the specifics. What do you mean by copyright violation? What are they? We need to be more specific. And in the situation so far is that people take for granted. So you come to the company and the company releases and you send the information, that's it. Right? So the disclosure is really just done. Um, I think that's a great question. <coughs> and it means that the transparency report is only the beginning uh, and it doesn't cover everything, right? You know, when we first came out with the Google Transparency Report, people thought that, oh, this must be everything, right? It's like, no, it's a tiny slice of what's going on behind the scenes. And if you look at, if you compare the Google Transparency Report uh, and what we reported in Hong Kong, and the, I, I forgot how many requests we actually get from Hong Kong, but it's a small, very small number it's compared to like, what the whole Hong Kong government uh, has. So what we need is obviously one, uh, is make sure that this picture, you know, this map where the blank, where the blacks are now, are being filled in. Right, that's one. And then two, the other question that goes to you, uh, to your, 
the comment that goes to your question is, what counts as a government request? So when things are outsourced, they don't capture, they're not captured into, into this report. Uh, and so one thing that uh, uh, we're at Google trying hard to fight is uh, this notion of uh, intermediate or platform liability. So like when, you know, like I don't know what uh, Wikipedia actually is being liable or not for, for, for certain things, right? And so, you, in, and in certain countries, right, you have this combination where, for example, certain speech is being criminalized, and it can actually end up in jail. Plus, the combination that platforms are being held liable for that stuff, right? If let's say you don't remove it right away, um, which basically means that uh, at that point, the government request, quote unquote, the censorship is being outsourced to private entities, right? And that's a, that's a whole different issue. Um, but you know, to answer your question, no, that doesn't count as a government request. But it's definitely something we should think about if we care about the open plan. Any more questions? Why are the ISP just closing it so easily? I mean, what are the contracts saying? Are there any contracts between terms and conditions of use or something like that? Sorry. Why are the ISP just closing so readily? Well, we, we spoke to. Um, one uh, member of the Hong Kong uh, ISP Association, and he did say that that there are ISPs who have policies to not. So part of what we have to break down is which ISPs are acting in which way. It sounds like there's a few that are fighting the requests and some that are not. Um, and, and we definitely, because the government has had just flat out refused to give the company names, we're not sure whether we're dealing what internet company we're dealing with, whether they're international companies or local ISPs. Uh, they did, in the data you'll see, there was some effort to make a distinction between local ISPs and, and ISPs outside. Um, but uh, we have to start asking those questions to the, to the ISPs and get a sense of their policy. I think the first step any company can do along the lines of a transparency report is state what their position is and how they function when a request is made. Okay, I have a question and I apologize if this has been covered with I'm feeling tired and have not been able to concentrate that well. So my question is, you know, apart from the transparency report, this is something we're seeing in India as well. Is there any sort of it's great to have a transparency report, it's great to have all that, but is there any sort of larger movement that is really trying to push back at these requests for more? Hong Kong? No. Actually, it, it seems that people are taking for granted that you know, you just give it to government. So the consciousness has to be uh, pushed. Well, I think step one is really raising awareness, right? Actually, you know, because most people don't even know this is happening and what scale and, and, and you know, like to what extent and and that's not to say that, again, you know, there are legitimate restrictions sometimes, right? Uh, but we want to make sure that those restrictions indeed are legitimate and the law are used in a legitimate way, right? Uh, and then we can start talking about the rest, you know? And so that's why this is, you know, it's such an important start, right, the Hong Kong Transparency Report, because it allows for that conversation to happen. And otherwise, you can't fight something if you don't know what you're fighting against. So we do send them, but chilling effects has a bit of a backlog. 
Okay. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, we're here if you have any more questions. So in five minutes, we're going to take a, a, a break, but in five minutes in this room, there is going to be an open discussion on transparency within Wikimedia. So not the broader topic of, of the report or anything, so specifically talking about foundation transparency, wiki transparency, all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, we'll take a five minute break um, and then we will reconvene back in this room if you are interested in having an open discussion about uh, transparency within Wikimedia and Wikipedia. Again, just a reminder that this room is going to be used for discussion, so you want to make sure that uh, all press and the media center, please. Maybe five extra minutes, it's good to It's good There's a whole other side after that, though, so. Boy, I'm a lost time. Okay, Greg? Yeah. Does it take long enough to talk to you? 306. 